Okay, great. Thanks, I'm Eric Sosemski. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, in seven minutes, we're gonna do seven months of Paclitaxel. Um, and so hopefully we'll have a few minutes for any questions. Um, my disclosures are mainly research grants to my institution. So December 2018, we all saw the first meta-analysis by Katsanos that demonstrated that drug-coded devices are associated with mortality. This is the two-year data of randomized trials. We look at the random effects model usually, and there was a 68% increased hazard or risk of mortality with these drug-coded devices. When you looked at three trials from the four to five year mark, there was up to 90% increased risk of mortality. So striking numbers, striking um, association, and you know, after we received these data, I think everybody was caught off guard and not sure how they were gonna be received by the public. But there was a kind of immediate rollout. So on the left here, we see a uh, kind of a newspaper uh, summary of two trials that were halted just a couple weeks after this paper was published in the Journal of American Heart Association. This was the Swede Pad and Basil trials. On the right here was the FDA's response in January, which suggested that we continue to use these devices, but that further investigation into this association was needed. So it was kind of a, a cautious but very um, liberal letter to let us continue to use these devices. However, in March, without too much going on in between there, um, there was an update to this letter, and this was after the FDA took their own look at the data, and they saw a similar signal in some pivotal randomized trials that they had used for approval of these devices. And because of this, um, the FDA recommended that we really avoid these uh, therapies, except for the highest risk patients. And so, as clinicians, we all had to step back and reassess how we were using these and how we were consenting our patients. And there was a significant dropout in the amount of drug-coded devices that were used across the country. We did have some reassuring data that came out during this time. This is an analysis by Peter Snyder, Medi, uh, Gary Ansel, many people here today, Tom Zeller, who looked at the impact data set from Medtronic. Um, they found no difference between the randomized and control arms. The control arm was small because most of these trials had a two to one randomization. But more importantly also, they showed this figure that demonstrated that there was no dose relationship between patients who received high doses of, of uh, paclitaxel from more treatments with uh, the paclitaxel impact device versus low uh, treatment. So these are tert styles of treatment, green being high, blue being um, low, and red being middle. So no difference. And so again, trying to link together why would paclitaxel cause harm, um, a dose response would be expected or suspected, and it wasn't seen here. Um, we published uh, shortly after this two studies from the Medicare data set on the left here was looking at ICD-10 codes for drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents in the year 2016. We found no association with mortality, both in unadjusted and adjusted analyses. On the right here, we looked back only at drug-eluting stents implanted in the inpatient setting using ICD-9 codes. And again, high risk of mortality as we know for our PDA population, but no association with mortality through 1,440 days. So shortly after this, um, there was a planned circulatory system advisory meeting that occurred just a couple weeks ago in DC. Um, it was really a, a well um, thought out and planned event and the FDA spent a lot of time preparing the data um, to show here. And I'm gonna summarize some of the main results that came from this panel. So this is the FDA's look at the data. They requested all the data be turned over to them from these device companies for their pivotal randomized trials. They also mandated that all these um, device companies go back and get as much follow-up as complete as possible. So that ranged from um, some companies having over 95% survival follow-up for all people in the trials, um, some in the 70 to 80%. This is the one-year um, FDA's meta-analysis that showed in the random effects now about a 14% now about a increased risk, but a confidence interval that um, was below and a, a, above one, um, suggesting that there was no harm at one year. At two years, we saw a 29% increased risk, but again, that confidence interval uh, crossed below one and above one, so there was no evidence of harm. And again, that differed from the Katsanos meta-analysis, although Katsanos had more trials in, included in his two-year data. In the year three, we started to see a little bit more suggestion of harm. So now in the 40% range, the tail end, the lower limits bound of that confidence interval is 0.86, so still not significant, but some suggestion of harm. And then at year four, um, we found here that the, uh, the suggestion of harm was maintained. So about 50% increased risk, but I'll mind you, the lower um, limits of that bound, that confidence interval was only 8% increased harm. So we can't tell if there's an 8% risk or 117% risk, um, but a wide confidence 
performance interval. So I think the conclusion during the panel was, yes, there is a signal of harm, but what does a signal of harm actually mean? Is that a statistical signal? Is that something screwy in these randomized trials? Or is there real causation between paclitaxel um, and mortality? And so in a deeper dive during the panel, we looked at causes of mortality. And here in blue are people who were exposed to paclitaxel, and red are those not. And this is our FDA analysis. And what we see here is that although you can see a higher mortality rate in the paclitaxel arm, um, the proportions were kind of similar and as expected um, between the two groups because, again, the mortality rates were lower than non-paclitaxel group. And similarly, when you broke that up by non-cardiovascular death subtypes, you kind of saw the expected proportions of death you would imagine between the two groups. So the summary of looking at these data was that there was really no clear signal that paclitaxel-coated devices was associated with an excess rate of specific um, death. In addition, there was these dose relationship curves that were produced for each um, device. Each specific device had different properties, so it was important to look at separate devices. And really, there was no real rhyme or reason between the dose and mortality, and so the conclusion here was no consistent association between uh, the two. We presented some updated Medicare data of now 150,000 patients followed through 1,573 days. We again found no evidence of harm between those treated with drug-coded and non-drug-coded devices. Here blue is non-drug-coded, red is drug-coded. We also produced uh, an analysis of the opt-in cohort, which is a lower-risk patient cohort of private payers and medical advantage payers, and found no evidence of harm through 1,400 days. So I'm just going to present, I think this slide is really important. On the left here is all the different meta-analyses. And as you can see, as we've continued to look at these data, add in survival data, um, look at as-treated population, the point estimates continue to get lower. So we're getting closer to one as we do a better job of looking at these data. We've also supplemented this with a lot of large, large real-world data. And all of the large real-world data, um, for what it's worth, has not shown any evidence of harm. So we're kind of stuck here with this signal of harm, but without causation. So where does that leave us? And what is next. I think the first thing that will be coming in the near future is labeling changes. I think there's going to need to be some refinement of that letter that was produced in March, but there's still going to be a caution of how do you talk to your patient, how do you discuss the risks and benefits, and how do we understand that there could be harm with these devices, whether or not um, we have clear evidence of that. Um, the second thing is specifying the population for treatment. So some still advocate that we should be reserving these for a high-risk population and that those low-risk patients with low comorbidities should be um, removed from treatment. Um, looking at continued follow-up through randomized trials is critical, especially for the Imperial and Illuminate trials who have not um, yet exceeded the uh, four-year mark. And then ongoing studies. Um, and again, we've already talked a little bit about um, Voyager, which I'm sorry was not on here, but there's also SweetPad in Europe ongoing, Bestia Align Basil, and we've had these real world data sets. Is a randomized trial in the future for this? I, I think the probably answer here is no, and this was also presented at the panel, that if you wanted to really demonstrate that there's no evidence of harm for mortality with these patients, you would need up to 40,000 patients, which would be the largest PAD intervention trial ever, to show no evidence of harm. I'm going to stop here for the sake of time. Thank you very much.